China exports to America 2.5 trillion dollars we buy from China. We sell back 1.5. The delta between those almost a trillion dollars. It's the biggest it's ever been. It's only getting worse. Ultimately, it'll be insurmountable for the United States. The question is why? The US trade deficit has never been higher and is growing. And while Americans stock up on foreign made goods, in return, foreigners are stocking up on American real estate, stocks, and government debt. But an innovative new American startup just got $10 million in funding to help narrow the gap. Mickey is an online platform that helps small and medium sized American producers to reach overseas buyers, opening up entire new markets and opportunities. Alex Ravens, pleasure to have you on Entity Business. Thanks, Paul. Alex, before we get into speaking about your very exciting new company, great idea, why don't you give us some sense from your perspective how American producers are feeling? Um, we've heard a lot about supply chain bottlenecks. We've heard about labor shortages in the country as well, businesses finding it hard to, to find people. But at the same time, we see commodity prices at, at record highs. So from, from your experience and your side, how are American producers, particularly the smaller producers that, that you're dealing with, how are they feeling at the moment? Um, I think for a number of years, the American producer has been somewhat of a forgotten demographic. Um, I think that in almost all cases, most manufacturing as a whole has moved overseas. And in many ways, our own manufacturers, who are the heart of America, have been almost forgotten and depressed. and. Uh, the American farmer, for instance, has a soaring suicide rate. And for us, uh, we didn't enter the business we were in to necessarily uh, ride on an opportunist commodity high. We really wanted to bring a bridge to the American supplier to allow them to begin to understand and sell to a new market, and that market is the export market. So where does Mickey come in? Well, I started Mickey uh, with my partner in 2018. Uh, the original vision was that we wanted to create the American Alibaba and to remind people of what Alibaba is. Alibaba is a Chinese company that services the world with their finished products. So. 98% of sellers on Alibaba are Chinese, and their buyers are the West, the United States, the West. So we saw what was happening, and we saw the amount that was being sold on Alibaba. And not only that, if you looked at a graph of China's rise as a global, global commercial power, and Alibaba's rise in popularity and value as a company, it's nearly the same graph. You could overlay them. So we saw that as our opportunity, given that Alibaba had only been servicing one direction of trade. That's called the hull, China to America. It's called the hull because that's all anyone cares about. Because what America is, is a buyer. We are a consumer. We buy from the rest of the world. We consume. Everything that comes here comes on a container. Those containers, they don't disintegrate. They have to go back to Asia. So what's that journey called? It's called the backhaul. Haul, backhaul. So we wanted to be the backhaul Alibaba. And we called the company Mickey. <laughs> we just figured it was a name everybody already knew how to spell. Could you give me an example of what one of these typical suppliers looks like in America and what they say to you whenever you come with your proposal? Well, depending on the business, uh, we are thinking about a uh, supplier that is typically operating a small to medium business, say a lumber mill in the United States. Whether that's the Midwest, whether that's the South, whether that's the Northwest, that's just a question of species or type. If you think about hardwoods, you think about softwoods, that's really just a matter of what region of the United States are they in. Um, 
these people, they typically sell domestic or they are selling to some of the larger, larger aggregators. Those aggregators are either going to process their lumber, sell it to a downstream uh, consumer facing company, or maybe they'll aggregate it and sell it overseas, sell it to a large buyer in Asia. So what we've just done is rather than allowing the suppliers in America to sell to a large aggregator who sells on to a large buyer, we've given them the ability to sell directly to a small to medium business overseas that looks a lot like them. Now the questions will be, what are the problems with doing that? Why hasn't it happened yet? Nobody is racist. There's no xenophobia. These suppliers would love to work with a buyer overseas that will pay them more than a mill down the street. The challenge is financing. The challenge is availability, lead generation. These are all things that tech has solved in consumer businesses for the last 20 years. So for us, we get to really stand on the shoulders of tech solutions that have already existed. We just get to bring them to an industry that's been antiquated, probably hasn't changed a lot since the East India Trading Company. What is your ultimate vision? How do you see this playing out? You mentioned the American heartland um, at the beginning of our, of our talk. You mentioned the trade deficit offline. How do you see this thing growing and, and applying to America on a, on a macro scale? When we think about uh, our opportunity, we think about the trade deficit. And most people don't think about the trade deficit. It's become one of those words that's almost lost meaning because of how many times we've heard it, whether in political trope or uh, in a newspaper article. For us, that trade deficit is very meaningful. China imports, excuse me, China exports to America $2.5 trillion we buy from China. We sell back 1.5. The delta between those, almost a trillion dollars. It's the biggest it's ever been. It's only getting worse. Ultimately, it'll be insurmountable for the United States. The question is why? And the first item we had to look at was, what are the products that each country is selling to each other? China is selling to the United States finished products. The United States is selling to China the natural resources, aka materials, to make more finished products. The challenge is that one container of iPhones, furniture, toys, it's going to be a lot more expensive than one container of logs and usually a lot easier to ship. So for us, it's really about finding a way to logistically handle a huge volume of material without a lot of resources. And when I say resources, I mean originally capitalization. Next, availability of shipping. Container space is at a premium right now, and none of the shipping lines are American. They are all either foreign-owned, European-owned, or legacy uh, shipping lines that uh, don't give us a lot of attention, except as a buyer base. So for us, exporting is really an art, and it's an art that we had to learn to get good at, and I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but we're trying. What keeps you up at night with your vision? Where are your, your, your biggest hurdles? Where is it where, you know, okay, team, when we get here, we've got to be ready to jump this hurdle or it's, it's game over? Uh, credit risk. Um, when we started, uh, we never truly understood that the banking system uh, is not a global banking system. Some of the software that it's built on is, is extremely antiquated and in, in many ways built for a Western banking level of sophistication. Uh, the challenges that we encounter and the things that keep me up at night are that our buyers being international, we have to get very, very elevated at our ability to ensure that uh, we've de-risked the transaction. 
when we were starting, we really struggled with that. And I think we played cowboy once or twice. And today we have a credit check. We have an entire department that does that. But for us, one way to grow revenue very fast is loosen up your restrictions. And the good part is that we've had the operational discipline to not allow ourselves to do that. That's an interesting point because for a smaller American producer, it's just not possible to, to do this type of de-risking and these types of credit checks, right? Well, that's the big challenge. We thought we were in a business that at its heart was just offering them access to a buying market. The truth is that not only do they need access, but if you think about the West and the United States and the way we purchase, we buy in advance. When you go on Amazon, Tonight, when you think about your paper towels, when you make that purchase, they're going to charge you. When we sell on Mickey, the buyer typically doesn't pay until we've already shipped the merchandise. So for us, <laughs> I think that keeps us all up at night a little bit. Wow. What have you had to do? Well, what have you learned in your, um, you know, how have you adapted to to, to fix this. We've had to hire for the best people that understand credit. We've had to learn what Refinitiv does in terms of searching for buyer validation. Uh, other countries have versions of Dun & Bradstreet where they rate their buyers and we've learned to really be careful about the type of buyer and the, the, the level we set in terms of the people we want to work with. Because we'd love to work with as big of a buyer base as humanly possible. It's very hard to take a plane and meet every single buyer, however. Absolutely. So are the producers excited, the people you go to? Do they, do they recognize the, the opportunity? They're excited. I think sometimes they're scared. I think there's been a fear of the unknown to an extent, and they're very proud, very American. So for them, uh, the idea that serving a global market with their product is actually serving America and helping to build up our ability to equalize the uh, scales around the world, uh, there's not as much uh, raw raw attitude around that quite yet. For us, we come and sell a dream of what we are able to accomplish together if we open up a global market and unlatch the domestic only sales. However, it's a large mountain to climb. So how is the business model? How do you guys make your cut? Yeah, so we uh, what we typically do, we'll have a supplier on one side, a buyer on the other side. And it really is as simple as supplier X, logistics Y, and buyer is paying Z. And whatever is Z minus Y minus X is typically Mickey's cut. We like to target a 10% margin. However, occasionally we'll see some margin compression based on things that are out of our control. Recently, why, or the logistics piece of it, has really, really taken off. It's due to the influx of import that's happened during COVID-19 due to two things, e-commerce explosion, PPE. The two of those have really led to a surge in import prices and a difficulty getting export rates. Can you explain that? Sure. When I was talking about the hull and the back hull, you can think about that being A and B. So usually, or, or traditionally, A plus B equals C. C being the total cost of a global voyage, round trip. That's the way shipping lines would typically look at it, traditionally. Post-COVID is a new tradition. A became so popular and so needed, so in demand, that the price surged so much that the price of B actually went below zero. So the shipping lines were shipping so much to the West and so little back that 
it actually became more efficient to simply turn the boat around. So they weren't stopping to fill up anymore. They were simply sending the boat back. So for American exporters, what ends up happening is you get rolled, which is a saying that means the boat doesn't stop. <laughs> Usually you get rolled to another vessel, but occasionally you get rolled past a vessel, past a vessel, it's like missing a flight, and it's completely out of our control. So for us, as the seller, it's very hard. There are global forces at work that are always out of our control. The best we can do is have a North Star, try to follow it as best we can. How is this possible? This is America. This is the United <laughs> States. How could you be getting roll vessel after <laughs> vessel because there's nothing to send well, we don't out own, of the country? We don't own any of the shipping lines. So they are not ours and, and we have very little ability to control them, control their rates, control the rules around how they charge suppliers. And if Elon Musk were attacking the problem, he'd probably build a pipeline between the US and Asia for containers and we could just flip, send it on its way. But we have me, not Elon Musk, so we have to build a process that is scalable and highly disciplined so we can begin to operationally attack this problem. Any idea when these problems might iron themselves out? <laughs> well, it depends on what the strategy is. Uh, recently, politicians have thrown out the idea that perhaps if we move manufacturing back to the United States, we'll become more sufficient domestically. Good luck. I think that the manufacturing that has happened uh, and moved overseas is likely here to stay. And for America, rather than trying to force companies to move manufacturing back to America or try to start taxing or levying other countries on the goods they sell to the US, we should begin exporting. We should begin selling back the products that the world wants to buy from America. And what are they? Natural resources. It's one of our biggest economic sectors. It's commodities. Bring it online. You mentioned Mickey takes about a 10% cut, ideally, but not always. How do the producers feel? Are they making up that difference by exporting whenever there is a, a foreign deal? Yeah, so what we will do actually is we will split that margin with the producers rather than try to beef up the margin for ourselves. And that's something that the suppliers never really had access to. So the buyer pays you? That is correct. The buyer pays Mickey. Mickey has already financed the transaction with the supplier. And then Mickey gets to pay part of the profit back to the supplier themselves. So it's a great deal for the supplier. They're getting paid in advance and they're p getting a piece of the profit as well and sharing it with us. They're also exposing themselves to a global market that otherwise they wouldn't get into on their own. And for Mickey, we get to increase our footprint and hopefully access a larger and larger demographic of users. So you're opening up a whole new market for these producers. They, does it cost them anything to re list with you guys, to register with you guys, or it's just like Alibaba where you're just there? It's completely free. Suppliers pay nothing, buyers pay nothing. We transact just like they would in real time, except we're providing a channel. It's just the fear. There's the fear <laughs> of, of the unknown. That's your biggest challenge. Sure. There's a, there's somewhat of a hyper-local feeling in terms of the demographic that's supplying. Uh, this might be a demographic that is selling to someone in their city that they know very well that they've sold to for 20 years. So the idea that they're going to start shipping containers to India, China, Vietnam can be very scary. One of our best customers is a customer in Philippines. He's fabulous, talks to me all the time. But prior to meeting him, I had never worked with anyone in the Philippines. New relationships, new customer base, and hopefully something that can build and be fruitful. How fast do you want to scale? I think we all want to scale fast. The question is, what will the market allow us? For us, it's very easy to scale 
and very easy to die. So being able to put rules on and grow with those rules intact, is, uh, it's like trying to play three-dimensional chess. For us, I think building out the right team, finding people that are smarter than us, especially at their commodity base, is the real key to building a team. For us, it's been people from the industry and supernatural tech talent. And as long as we keep on combining both and trying to find a way for them to speak the same language, the company is getting built the right way. For you as the entrepreneur, how's the difference been between expectation and reality when you were taking on the project? <laughs> uh, our expectations were immediately shattered, I would say, <laughs> almost, almost as, as early as I could have possibly imagined. I think that uh, starting a company after having experienced some success, be it in a corporate environment, can be very scary. Uh, it's almost punishment because one is used to a certain level of hygiene and they go to uh, certainly a different level. However, what's missing in the corporate life for me was purpose. And every day is really, really filled with purpose. My inbox every morning is filled with sometimes angry, sometimes happy, sometimes merciful purpose. And for me, it's inc incredibly engaging and much more exciting than I ever was having uh, in my previous life. Are you positive about the outlook for America? I think we are beginning to face issues that for many years have been ignored, whether it's global warming, uh, whether it's the trade deficit. I hope that these large issues can be engaged and rather than continue to use as, as, as sayings or fables, continue to be dismantled to their core so that problem solving techniques can be added to help actually strategize a plan. I think a lot of people want things, but there is a huge difference between wanting them and making a plan and doing it. So for us, we see the trade deficit as the next huge problem. Great place to end it. Alex Ravens, pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs>